It's a pleasure now to introduce my co-chair again, Mary Stripe from the University of Chicago, where she has made many contributions, I think, to our care and understanding of uh, patients with a variety of interstitial diseases. And she's going to give us an update and advances in the therapy for scleroderma. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about a different autoimmune disease, the autoimmune disease uh, scleroderma or systemic sclerosis. These are my conflicts of interest. So interstitial lung disease in scleroderma is common and likely underrecognized. It's important to note that the lung disease may not track with the rheumatologic features, which makes it a bit more challenging in terms of diagnosis. And it's clear to those of us who take care of patients with scleroderma that the interstitial lung disease is indeed a cause of great morbidity and some mortality. As I mentioned, it may masquerade as idiopathic disease, and as I'd like to talk about today, there's increasing evidence that we have uh, robust information about effective treatment for patients with scleroderma ILD. Today I'm going to talk about new understanding uh, in the guidelines, uh, updated guidelines on diagnosis, the emerging role of exposures, and then as I said, finish up by talking about a couple new trials of treatment. So the American and European uh, rheumatology associations published in 2013 new criteria for the diagnosis of scleroderma. Uh, these criteria are easily searchable, actually I think quite uh, easily usable in the clinic, and what I think is most impressive is that the rheumatologists have recognized the importance of the contribution of the lung and included both pulmonary hypertension and interstitial lung disease within their diagnostic category, uh, which uh, has not been done for the other connective tissue diseases. In addition, they included uh, a robust validation cohort within their diagnostic criteria with sensitivity and specificity over 90%. Scleroderma ILD is noted in the majority of patients with scleroderma. Fortunately, it seems to be progressive uh, in uh, a minority, although um, we need more information on uh, the exact figure uh, of, of that. It is associated with the uh, scleroderma antibody, and lower lung function is associated with worse outcome. I show you here a series of CT scans from a patient that I've cared for now for 20 years, who presented uh, in the late 90s with systemic sclerosis. The main finding really was the interstitial lung disease, but he had near normal lung function and has not been on treatment. In 2003, that seemed like a wise decision, um, but uh, over the course of the last few years, I think you'll see that uh, his CT now shows some honeycomb fibrosis. Now, if he were in his 80s, that might not be uh, a big deal, um, but he originally presented in his 40s, and so now he's a very otherwise very healthy man in his early 60s um, with some significant fibrotic interstitial lung disease. I also want to talk a little bit about our understanding of the CT pattern on, uh, uh, in patients with interstitial lung disease from scleroderma. The majority of patients have NSIP, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, but this comes into flavors, and many of the patients with systemic sclerosis and ILD have the fibrotic flavor. And so while the prognosis is much better than with usual interstitial pneumonia, it is, as you saw in the patient um, I showed you previously, uh, it, it can be a fibrotic process uh, that can progress. We have uh, published on patients with UIP in the setting of connective tissue disease um, and have shown um, in a nice uh, paper by Dr. Chung that there are certain findings on the CT, including the straight edge sign, which you see on the coronal views. So unlike the honeycomb fibrosis that hugs the periphery in IPF, in patients with connective tissue ILD, including scleroderma, uh, there is more of a straight edge or pancake sign, and then the exuberant honeycombing that I've shown here is also much more characteristic of UIP from a connective tissue disease. 
In addition, uh, a uh, process in the lung that has been thought to be rare, but I think I certainly am seeing um, increasingly commonly, uh, pleural parenchymal fibroelastosis, where there's upper lobe fibrotic thickening uh, along with uh, subadjacent parenchymal fibrosis. This upper lobe process can coexist with lower lobe NSIP or UIP and has been shown to be due to recurrent infections and exposures, but I've, as I've noted in patients in my clinic and as was noted in this publication, can also be seen in scleroderma. And so I suggest if you see this pattern in a patient in your clinic, uh, you undertake a thorough evaluation for uh, systemic sclerosis and other autoimmune diseases. I want to spend just a minute talking about some data um, that I think is probably not um, widely uh, recognized uh, for the role of occupational exposures uh, in the connective tissue diseases and in particular in systemic sclerosis. A French study uh, looked at 100 subjects with systemic sclerosis and compared them to 300 age, sex, and cigarette match controls. And what they saw that there was a significant increased risk of systemic sclerosis in patients who had exposure exposure to silica, uh, other th paint thinner and other solvents, and welding fumes. As you can see by the occupations listed, the exposures um, actually did uh, significantly differ by gender. In a, uh, a, another study, this one uh, in an Italian center, uh, looking at patients who presented now with a formal pneumoconiosis, pulmonary silicosis, Patients all had advanced uh, interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis and were being evaluated for lung transplant. Of those 40 cases, nine patients had autoimmune disease, which is a sevenfold increase over the general population. Six of nine had mediastinal adenopathy, and three of those patients had scleroderma, with this uh, showing the digital ischemia and infarcts that we sometimes see in patients with systemic sclerosis and was seen in a, a male patient in this study. The CDC, of course, has been very busy um, helping us understand uh, the uh, vaping uh, uh, acute lung injury. Um, there also has been work um, from them and from a group in Australia uh, looking at uh, stone fabrication and its role um, in causing significant progressive interstitial lung disease with uh, some patients also having autoimmune disease. And so this stone fabrication results in a high level of toxic exposure to respirable uh, silica, uh, and in some patients, scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, other autoimmune diseases, um, much more commonly seen in men. Um, and many patients, but not all, have classic silicosis. Others have upper lobe fibrosis and mediastinal adenopathy. Unfortunately, it is progressive, sometimes even years later. Hence, sometimes I think the dissociation between recognizing the occupational exposure um, and uh, is uh, sometimes fatal. Um, and it is likely that this is preventable um, with appropriate wetting of the stone um, during the fabrication process and perhaps with mass. And so the conclusion uh, by Turner et al. was that patients presenting with connective tissue disease should have a full occupational history taken. And so I would conclude this part of my talk uh, by suggesting, like in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, in patients with autoimmune ILD, uh, there is a balance between injury and repair, um, and that the clinical presentation may indeed, um, as uh, Dr. Rosas has said, uh, involve some common genetic pathways, um, but then uh, a uh, exposure risk um, that we're just beginning to appreciate um, along with an aberrant immune response. So now I'd like to turn our, our attention to some of the new treatment options in patients with scleroderma ILD, and I'm going to talk about mycophenolate mofetel, rituximab, and nintenanib. So most of you probably are familiar with the scleroderma 2 lung study, which looked at uh, cyclophosphamide versus mycophenolate. Uh, patients had to have less than seven years of uh, systemic sclerosis. Uh, they, could have, they had to have restriction on PFTs, although um, some patients, um, as you can see by the FVC of 85, upper limit of 85%, had rather mild disease. The CT had to show ground glass opacity, and the primary endpoint was change in vital capacity 
capacity as a percent predicted, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. Um, this uh, looks at the survival probability, and while this was a secondary outcome and was not officially positive, um, I think all of us would rather be in the group um, at the top that received mycophenolate, both because the outcome sure looks better and the side effects were much less, uh, as you see here um, uh, on the, the bottom of that graph. Uh, also, um, there was a 3%, 2 to 3% improvement in the percent predicted vital capacity in both groups. Um, but um, I think most of us would agree that mycophenolate mofetil is a much, much better and less toxic um, agent. So sometimes uh, patients have progressive uh, interstitial lung disease um, with uh, connective tissue disease. Um, and there's now an emerging understanding that for some of these patients, um, IV therapy with rituximab um, is uh, a, a very effective salvage therapy. And so this is another prospective randomized, but here open label study. Um, number of subjects is rather small. Um, patients all had diffuse scleroderma along with skin involvement and were randomized to IV cyclophosphamide versus rituximab with the primary outcome percent predicted FVC at six months. There was an improvement um, in the uh, primary endpoint in the rituximab group, while uh, unlike in scleroderma uh, 2, the cyclophosphamide group actually declined, although really, uh, if you look at the data, they essentially stayed the same, but there certainly was a difference uh, in the efficacy of these two agents. Um, the skin score also fell um, in the rituximab group. It was unchanged in the site. Uh, taxan group, although prior studies, um, the scleroderma 1, have suggested that cyclophosphamide has some efficacy for um, the skin disease in scleroderma. Um, and as uh, we all recognize, there are serious adverse events um, that um, in this study were definitely more common with cyclophosphamide. And so the conclusion was that rituximab was more efficacious and better tolerated. So I'm going to turn uh, and finish with a discussion of the census trial, which was uh, just recently reported and published. Um, again, nicely done, rigorous trial looking at the antifibrotic nintenanib versus placebo over the course of a year. Uh, patients with systemic sclerosis were allowed to be on background mycophenolate therapy. Um, and again, uh, patients had to have relatively early scleroderma. Um, the HRCT had to show at least 10% fibrosis. Um, patients could have uh, normal lung function. Vital capacity requirement was only that it be greater than 40%. And the primary endpoint was the annual rate and decline in vital capacity over 52 weeks. Um, and as you see here, this is a graph that's becoming very familiar to us when we look at the efficacy of antifibrotics in a variety now of fibrotic interstitial lung diseases. Um, and you can see that the, the patients who got nintenanib had a much slower decline uh, than the patients who received placebo. And the other thing I note on uh, in all of the studies is that the divergence occurs rather early. And so patients really seem to be getting benefit from the antifibrotic therapies after weeks um, of therapy, um, which I think is uh, very interesting to note. Uh, here you see the number of patients. The uh, extent of fibrosis had to be less than 10%, but the mean was 36% in both groups. Um, FVC percent predicted 72%, so again, a rather mild population. Um, and then the difference in the annual rate of decline in vital capacity. Um, there was no effect on skin score or, um, unfortunately, on patient um, reported outcomes or quality of life. Um, adverse events, uh, as you might expect, um, were a little, uh, were not overall different, but gastrointestinal toxicity was higher um, in terms of diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting in the patients who received uh, nintenanib um, with uh, those of us who use mycophenolate mofetil knowing that some of those GI toxicities are actually uh, seen uh, with that drug as well. Um, although, um, it, the, I think the impression was that most patients tolerate both therapies in this trial. Um, so 
now that we have some treatments that seem to have some efficacy, um, we are going to need to have more rigorous, robust data to help us decide whom we need to treat. And right now, that really is at the level of expert opinion. And so I think the expert opinion right now is that if you have more than mild, um, in quotes, quote unquote, mild, ILD on HRCT, um, not entirely clear what that definition is, progressive ILD, symptomatic ILD, um, it is likely um, that therapy should be offered. Um, this is a uh, recent, um, but but small and not really very robust, um, retrospective study that maybe gives us a little bit of insight. Um, patients had mild systemic sclerosis, um, uh, FVC greater than 85%. And so many of us would probably in the old days not be treating those patients. Of those 294 patients, they chose to treat, um, uh, of, those pa of the 294 patients, 116, excuse me, had mild disease. Um, and of those 116, 13 were exposed to cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate at baseline. Um, and those who um, had uh, immunosuppressive therapy at baseline had a higher FVC um, than those that were unexposed um, with uh, no progression versus 24 pro percent progression in the unexposed. So not a robust study, but a little bit of a sense that early treatment um, may be a benefit, although I think many of us would argue cyclophosphamide would not be, uh, most of us would argue, not be the drug that we would want to use in a patient with mild disease. Um, and so in summary, um, I think there have been some significant advances in the field of, of scleroderma ILD with refinement uh, in the diagnostic criteria. I really think these criteria are a roadmap that, that could be followed for other guidelines um, in terms of their uh, inclusion uh, of a, um, a, a validation cohort within the guidelines, um, expanded HRCT patterns that should lead us to think about systemic sclerosis. Um, I think more and more there may be a recognition of exposures contributing to autoimmunity um, and certainly um, to um, systemic sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, ILD, um, and that there is now some evidence base on which to um, decide on therapy. Um, and then, uh, as um, we have um, really all benefited from our interactions with patients, um, I add a quote from a patient who emailed me after I spoke at the uh, at the uh, Scleroderma Foundation a few months ago, to, and had talked a little bit about exposures. And her email was, "I wanted to add my story to the research of the connection between scleroderma and silica. I worked with fibroglass and had silica exposure from age 23 to 38." And then she finished, and nobody ever asked me about about um, my occupation or exposures. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>